So yesterday I was in the grocery store and I noticed that half the produce section was virtually empty. Store shelves nearly empty. The only milk I can get were two tiny bottles. The supply chain is very fragile. There are so many incredible moving parts. He fears it will drive up the price of consumer goods. Where's our lettuce and tomatoes going to come from? This is a deep winter greenhouse trying to stay warm, grow food with little or no energy. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today on the channel, we're gonna talk about how you can survive in one of the most treacherous, inhospitable places on earth, and that is Northern Saskatchewan. Right now, it is a frigid minus 31 degrees Celsius. And from what I'm told, Inside this building standing next to me, which is heated by nothing more than the power of the sun, no electricity, no natural gas, it's supposed to be the complete opposite. It's 30 degrees Celsius in there right now. You know, we all talk about bug out bags and the fear gear, and we fantasize about being some rogue nomad uh, running around the post-apocalyptic wasteland. But the fact is people are gonna die of one of three reasons, disease, exposure to the elements or starvation. Well, this solution that you see behind me resolves two of those problems. Starvation allows you to grow food year round and it's also going to keep you warm when the temperature drops well below zero. So enough talk, let's go inside and see what they got going on in there. So Dean, tell us a bit about what you got going on here. Cool, so my name is Dean and uh, the, our company in greenhouse is Arcopia, our farm. This is a deep winter greenhouse or passive solar greenhouse. So essentially a super insulated structure specifically designed for our latitude and the location of the sun. Essentially trying to stay warm, grow food with little or no energy. So today it's minus 31 feels like minus 41 and it is currently 24 Celsius in here with no additional heat, just the sun. Be sure to go and subscribe to the Arcopia YouTube channel if you want to learn how to grow food in one of the coldest environments on earth. It's pretty amazing coming in here and it's almost like a biome of sorts. You got flies in here, you got plants, you got water running, you got animals. What you've done here is pretty fantastic because you found a way to, like you say, have a, a place where you have a warm environment year round where you can grow food without almost no energy input. That's just fantastic. Yeah, well, we could have moved to Belize, but I thought this was cheaper, so. Yeah. <laughs> but we like it here. It's got nice four seasons. The winter will, uh, it's supposed to be a time for rest, but now I got to work, but. <laughs> it gets cold here. It can get depressing here. Those days are short, man. You can't go outside, like your skin freezes in seconds someday. You can't take the kids outside, like it's terrible. But where uh, we live, it's one of the sunniest places in Canada, actually, I think. And I'm going to utilize that sun to its fullest potential. This thing, it's got very little carbon footprint, very little ongoing costs. I spent all my time and energy and money up front, and I think this is very important moving ahead in the future. Keep our bills down, our ability to produce up, our health up. Vitamin D is so important. We have our jackets off in Saskatchewan in a place that's not being heated, and uh, the sun is touching our skin and we're actually getting D, which is rare for where we live. At. Just the simple fact that this is being heated by nothing more than the sun and of course all the work you put into it prior to this, uh, yet we, you know, we're driving by these huge uh, 5,000 square foot mansions that don't have any of this and they're not designed to be efficient at all, uh, especially in the day and age that we're living in. That just reminds me of how inevitable <laughs> the collapse of society is if we're continuing along that trajectory. Uh, whereas you have this uh, one oasis in the prairies, uh, one person who is doing this that I know of, I'm sure there's maybe a few other people, but it's absolutely not common enough. And I don't want to be the only guy doing this either. <laughs> exactly, I would like yeah. you to give it, everybody to give it some thought if you're going to, yeah. you know, build anything, you know, you could just situate it. The sun is that way, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you, you think you might have a view that way and want to do a walkout basement with windows on the north, you know, just consider not having a heating bill. It actually literally costs no more money if you're building any house 
warehouse, barn, uh, wherever the sun is for your latitude, you can build it specific for that, give it a little bit of thought, and then do it. So. And even just the psychological ambiance of coming into a place like this, you know, I mean, you got your kids' playground here, you got dog, and it's just uh, a great place of refuge in the, the long, cold winter. I just think there's a multitude of reasons to do this, even if you're not an environmentalist or you're not a prepper. I mean, I just think that this makes perfect sense and I'm surprised there's not a construction company who's uh, capitalized on the opportunity and they probably will after watching this video, but uh, to, you know, offer people something like this. If I wasn't so busy, you could make an entire life, like I'm a builder by trade, That's I, I built this entirely myself, no help little bit of machinery like a skid steer and attachments and whatnot but this guy's pretty much the all-american prepper guys everything except the heads on pikes when coming up to his property here so it's not time just for in that case yet. for you guys yeah. you know who want to try to triangulate his coordinates just remember this guy's the all-american prepper if you well like i made a decision years ago when i you know you you, you learn about preparedness and 50 years ago, they just called that normal human behavior. Like, Grandma wasn't a prepper, but uh, I got to learn canning from her. And we, my wife and I and the whole family, we made an entire life out of it. So our farm, this is where we live. This is, it provides us food, water, shelter, security, recreation. It's a good life. It's not, I'm not insane. I don't think the sun's going to fall out of the sky someday. Yeah, it's not just, uh, it doesn't have to be a downgrade in the standard of living. No. This can this actually an be an upgrade in the standard of living. Just coming into a place like this is, you know, I, you know, I'm very jealous of what you got going on here. Essentially, the majority part of the building you see, except for the south end, is just a standard built, how any house or commercial building would be built but with super insulation. R60 is about max insulation and then any anything above that, it gets to be redundant. R48 walls, four feet under the ground, the entire perimeter is a uh, frost protection, four feet down insulation. The entire greenhouse is a heat sink, but then the geometry for our latitude, we're latitude 53 right here. So winter solstice, sun angle, 14 degrees above elevation. In the summer solstice, 60 degrees above elevation. So this entire building is built with the geometry of the sun. At the winter solstice, the sun hammers the entire back wall and all of the thermal mass system to keep heat for the overcast days and every night. And in the summertime, it doesn't hit any of that thermal mass, but I can still grow in the entire front area of the greenhouse. So, so basically what you're saying is that in the winter time, it's designed so that it attracts more sunlight. And in the summer, it's designed so it, it attracts less sunlight. So it's not gonna overheat in the summer and it's not gonna be too cool in the winter, but you do have some redundant systems in place just in case. So our primary heating is the sun that integrates both the sunlight and thermal mass. So thermal mass is just anything on the inside of a building that will equalize in temperatures. When the sun's shining, I want that to hit thermal mass. Uh, so this includes the entire heat sink ground. Concrete is going in painted black and roughly seven or 8,000 gallons of water exposed to the sun. Every time the sun hits that, it's warming the water. Every night when the sun goes away, it's radiating back. This is the, these are the water barrels that you use to store the thermal mass. So these are being heated by the sun right now. You only have two here right now, but the plan is to have, what, like 50 or something on the back wall? Exactly. So again, just another test I'm doing as I'm building this thing. But uh, after the concrete, I'm going to put 50 of them along the back wall and black barrels so the sun's hitting them it is warming up the water so i have a little temperature probe in there and it's just about 70 degree water right now and it's only noon it's going to get a little warmer in here we got a lot of sunlight hours yet but for now i have before the thermal mass is in and, and the entire structure is complete as a whole uh, wood fire every evening and then on the coldest nights or if we have a heavy overcast day without full sun uh, that natural gas furnace is there as the backup to make sure the tropicals don't go dormant. My energy bill and consumption for a building this size and where we're located is very, very minimal. You know, I know a lot of preppers like myself, 
you know, we like doing it ourselves. So to know that you could build a, a structure like this uh, by yourself, if you just had the time, and this is what you did with your time during the pandemic, correct? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, well, I've been researching for many years, and eventually I had all the puzzle pieces there. And geez, I have enough. I'll start building it. But it's been a year and a half in roughly um, thousand to twelve hundred man hours. So yesterday I was in the grocery store and I noticed that half the produce section was virtually empty and uh, it just got me thinking more and more about why I need to have a plan for how I'm going to grow food, be able to replenish my supplies so I'm not just relying just on stored energy. Can you tell us a bit about what your motivation for doing this was? Well first like, like what you uh, just mentioned there, you want for the, any food interruption, like the supply chain is very fragile. There is so many incredible moving parts, monoculture, massive, massive farming operations. And I think the average food for us in Canada travels 3000 miles before it gets to us. So it's already, it's not even fresh anymore by the time we get, but anyways, it's uh, a combination of storing food, especially things that we can't locally grow here. So that's why I did our freeze-dried smoothies, it's all imported uh, products, but you know, as a prepper, you want to put away, we don't grow rice here, that's important. We don't grow coffee here, that's important. Where are we going to get sugar, salt, spices? You know, I like that. So you want a combination, put, put a few things away, like it don't be crazy, but you know, you overstock your pantry is a good idea, just like grandma did, but then a greenhouse like this gives you the opportunity to do things that can't be freeze-dried or that you want fresh. My entire life, I've been an entrepreneur, many businesses, failed businesses, been screwed over, had rental properties, building houses. The entire system, you get these little tidbits firsthand, and it's things that you don't learn unless you experience them firsthand. So then that you do a deep dive into real basic economics and try to figure out like, what is this currency? What is money printing? Like, how, does, how do these things work? Where does food come from? What does it take to grow food? And it's, oh, you get a little anxious. And uh, we bought Bear Land, I guess, 10 years ago now and been in a semi-anxious state building like a madman. So <laughs> you're building the ark. Well, yeah, uh, you, you want to do it quickly. I mean, uh, inflation is real. It's hitting everything. Definition of inflation is a expansion of the money supply. It isn't increasing prices. Uh, prices increasing is a consequence of them counterfeiting currency into existence. There's not much I can do about that, but w the, what I can do is turn inward and look after myself. So It's almost as if there's this crowd moving in one direction, that, like just in the movie The Matrix, you know, when Neo is trying to walk this way and all the rest of the people are walking the other way. What you're doing is antithetical to a current society and we were joking around yesterday how good luck getting a loan to build a place like this that tells you right there you know where we're headed as a society right? exactly because yeah there's no there's no financing if I ever wanted to sell this place like a mortgage broker is not gonna know um, an appraiser person like what do I do with this so, like the whole system the bankers gonna be like what and then for far, farm loans, it's just loans on uh, commodity farming. So how many thousands of acres of, of canola do you grow? And then <laughs> it's actually really hard on the psyche when you're going against upstream because there's not, not much help to it, but it's worth it. And just so you guys know, Dean has his own YouTube channel and we're going to try to get him to 10,000 subs. That's my goal with this video. <laughs> yeah. So I want everybody to head on over there, subscribe to his channel, because he's going to tell you how to build a place like this, brick by brick. Uh, that's one of the biggest concerns of mine is, you know, what would we do if the natural gas stopped flowing for whatever reason, right? There was a cyber attack or you just never know nowadays. So what, what are these windows made of and, you know, how does this work? Like I'm obsessed about high efficient building envelopes and design and back in the 70s and 80s there were some fellows uh, wrote a few books that I, I read on it but uh, glass would ref reflect light but this new polycarbonate material, twin wall polycarbonate on the outside, it refracts the light so the sunlight will hit it and then disperse so I'm not, I didn't have to build it exactly perpendicular to the sun 
So I designed this more as a, more a function because I do want to use this when it's plus 35 Celsius outside as well. So the outside just briefly would be a twin wall polycarbonate. Polycarbonate's used on the outside because on the prairies the wind is so bad. My actual first greenhouse is still up in the trees outside. Uh, it's just it was just a small poly one, but yeah. the wind is something else. So this is like aerodynamic like if you wanted to drag the building 60k down the highway that it would keep together <laughs> like that's that's what we have to deal with at this 45 degree angle i don't have a snow load it'll have maybe a skiff on there and then it'll zip off all at once so it's just the wind load you have to worry about and on the inside is a uh, six mil greenhouse poly uv resistant five and a half inch air gap is a significant insulator as well and i see you have the you have windows on the sides as well. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. And then the heat of the, the summer, I can open up that entire uh, bottom, all the windows, all the sides, an overhead door on the north. And uh, the greenhouse isn't big enough that it has enough airflow. It doesn't overheat. And actually all that water I'll have at the back and thermal mass. The sun won't be hitting it, so it's always cooler and will suck the heat. Like the thermal mass also works as a cooling, just like trying to use it as heating in the winter. The perimeter outside in the ground, because I've seen some uh, that have raised beds, but you, you've had a different system where you're controlling the actual temperature of the ground here because you've actually dug a trench around the building and you have insulation so it's actually insulating what four feet deep or something like that yep they say our frost goes four feet but i've seen it go as low as 11 feet that ground is just gonna suck heat out of out of your building as well it just just as you build a house that has a footing or a basement it's the same same thing except instead of having a usable space in the basement, mine's filled up with solid clay and rock. So as the sun's hitting our soil and the gravel and the clay and eventually black concrete is gonna really absorb that sun. I call it actually passive geothermal. I, there's no moving parts, there's no air tubes underneath, it's just super insulation and the mass. All right, so what do you got growing in here? Well, this is this is new. We only started planting in October and now it's the middle of January. So we were able to do some of this stuff in the absolute dead of winter, but I got five little lemon trees here, some Chinese herbs and medicines, kind of this might be that area, but full-size tomatoes, parsley, herbs, like a flower in full bloom right now is nice to look at. And, and some of these plants are looking like a little droopy. Like obviously this is an experience, like you're just kind of getting into this, it's experimental, but can you tell us a bit about the limitations of, of growing? Cause we, we are currently in plant hardiness zone three. Yeah. And so we're, you know, we can basically grow grains. We're like right on the edge of the forest here, guys. It's practically Siberia. Yeah. So all we can grow naturally here is grains, but you're growing t tomatoes inside in the winter. What are the limitations of this? So the, uh, our intention is to get a few LED grow lights for this absolute deadest uh, part of winter that we're just past right now. So we brought in all this soil and then, and I like living soil with microbes and worms in there. But what came out of that was some aphids, uh, fruit flies and those bugs you don't want. So then we got uh, a fit of lights and they come like this and they're currently taking care of the aphids. Right now the aphid population is down, but we had to pull peppers, take them all away. There was the infestation, kind of treat that, and but they came to the tomatoes a little. But this is a, a good experiment with the low light, what we still are able to do. Everything seems to be more or less happy. There's a little uh, grape. Peas, like they're, they're good to go, ready to pick, right? So this in our extreme low light, right? Yeah. There's a zucchini I could probably pick. There's a few cucumbers coming. These are flowers. Some of the strawberries uh, took, but, and this is just like weeds like you get outside. When we have time, we weed and, and give it to the animals, fresh food. And yeah, all these, t like this is off of one or two little tomato plants is enough for like us. It's amazing stuff, so. Onions cool. seem to be doing good. Yeah. Gotta have those onions. Oh yeah. Uh, these are two little mango trees. Uh, at full maturity, they're probably too big for this greenhouse, but we'll see what happens. In the in the bed, we also have turmeric. We can't grow here. Sweet potatoes, we can't grow here. 
Like you can't, you mean we can't grow outside? Oh yeah, outside. But we Part of the this greenhouse is we're gonna be starting things well ahead of time. Where we live, the, the time between frosts is three months. You have three safe months to grow outside. And it and, should be uh, known that this is your first run at this and it's in the dead of winter. I'm pretty sure when we come back here at the peak of summertime, this place is gonna be you know, an entire oh, yeah. different. Or, or next winter. Or even next winter, yeah. So like, we're gonna come back and see what the progress is after. But exactly. right now, I mean, you're still producing food, which is yep. impressive. This we're, We can't grow figs here. So that's a beautiful fig tree and it is super happy. And so this little banana we bought uh, at a local greenhouse that brought it from Florida and it fit in the front seat of our car. It was like this and it lived in a pot as I was building it and it finally got its home in about uh, November. So there's three feet of soil there and the bananas don't like full sun, but in our short days, it's getting a little bit of full sun mm -hmm. and in the summer it'll be shaded. So this is a nice spot for it, but it is going to produce bananas and it's a dwarf variety. It'll get as tall as the roof still. And that leaf, I don't know, it, it makes you feel good standing beside a banana tree. So <laughs> it's a very surreal feeling to be standing in the middle of Saskatchewan with, next to a banana tree. So uh, when will this start producing bananas? I'm hoping another year, it's probably going to be two years and apparently it's it's all in one shot when it does and it's like 300 bananas so I either got to you know have lots of friends or or sell or sell them to my tiny customer base where I freeze dry them all. Freeze dried banana chips. Yeah Why exactly. Yeah. So. And so you got another one growing here? Yep, uh, just different variety as well. So. so you got your bananas, you got your oranges or your tangerines back here. These are the tangerines. Yep, the tangerines are on there. What is this plant back here? This one with the... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> A lot of that is my uh, wife's flowers. Like okay. even with food prices increasing, my wife is going to go for uh, try some local flowers. Like that's a bit of her passion. Yeah. But whatever she does in flowers, if something ever goes bad in the world, we just instantly switch because the system works for food as well. But sure. right now it's a bit of a cash crop for you. Yeah. Well, we're going to try it out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like the greenhouse is big for a homestead. It's, uh, but it's small because if you have, if you want to go in business to try to make a business out of it, you have to be big, but. And I've seen some greenhouses like this, they're, they're a lot bigger. Is there advantages to keeping it at this size or are you, are you content with this size? Is, are you wanting to expand it or, or do you think this is going to be it for? Yeah, this, this is all we're doing for the winter greenhouse. Maybe we'll do some hoop houses to just extend our growing season, maybe a few weeks or a month or something. Like not super insulated, just a quick hoop house. But this will be where we're starting things. This is where we'll be doing the winter food. And then as it warms up, we could move to hoop house and then to out, outside beds. So eventually you're going to have a bit of a permaculture set up here, which is the idea with permaculture is a no energy input system or very low energy input. And how close are you to achieving that? Well, yeah, there's permaculture principles. So there's... Um, plants that work together. So under that large banana plant, underneath you plant maybe strawberries or other ground cover things and try to utilize all the space. In the summer, our, our chickens are like a manure factory and then we take that fertilizer and that goes on the garden and then rabbits are some of the best fertilizer. When we get into the fish with the like 12 foot above ground pools in here, because I don't like aquaponics or hydroponics, um, we'll just filter that out and we can make fertilizer for gardens from fish waste. That's what permaculture is, I guess. It's um, everything works together as a symbiosis, right? If, if you have weeds to pick, those can go be utilized from a chicken and they give you eggs. And yeah, if you have too many eggs that you don't want to eat, then it's the best thing for a dog. And <laughs> the dog protects the farm and it all just, it works together. It the works whole, together, yeah. It does. Exactly. On the homestead, like I have so many things to maintain and look after and you, things work together. But, but this is just, that's how nature is. It's nothing new. It's just society and humans in general are very, very disconnected from nature. I'm no hippie, but this is, it works. Like, <laughs> this yeah. is where the hippies. I like, and the, I like guns right and building. Guys yeah. unite. <laughs> right here. This is the yes. spot. Okay, where the, the communist cameraman 
an all-American prepper can oh, yes. come yep. and be diplomatic together. Oh yeah, Pe peace on earth, you <laughs> could have it, you could have it, yeah, for sure. But, Absolutely. But you got guns just in case. Just so, in case. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you are also the owner of the Arcopia Freeze-Dried Food Company. If you don't know what freeze-dried food is, it lasts for 25 years, retains the same texture, the same nutrients. It's really uh, the superfood of the 21st century that almost nobody knows about. Now you make freeze-dried smoothies. You can get these from your website, Arcopia, if you wanna buy in bulk, or you can get them from Canadian Preparedness. Dot com use discount code survival prepper for 10% off and uh, we're gonna have one today and these things are delicious guys each smoothie is a pound of fresh fruit and there's two cups of spinach in the green one you can barely taste it though it's delicious you just add it to water in a shaker cup and it's like you have a freshly blended smoothie and it lasts 25 years is our best before date the way we have it stored, it'll last forever and ever. Because this is a, so, a six mil Mylar bag, right? Six mil Mylar, uh, it's moisture tested, uh, world renowned certifications. All the technology and energy is in that little pack and it's a good inflation hedge as well as we like smoothies and drink them daily. So, And that's what I've always said about freeze dried food is, the great thing about freeze dried food is you're not only preserving uh, the food but you're preserving the value so in 25 years if fruit even exists anymore that at the rate things are going this is going to have a much higher value than it does today because of the scarcity factor uh, this is perfect for a bug out bag because it's so small it's got a nice form factor and it's going to replenish your your nutrients that you need in a form that your body is going to recognize yeah real food's always your best bet right yeah absolutely so Enough talk, let's uh, let's get to the eating part. So 400-ish milliliters of water. 400 mils. This is all you have to do, guys. You can use a blender for this, or you can just do it like this. I will advise people, I've made the mistake before, when blending these, there's a little, uh, is this a little uh, oxygen absorber? Yep. Little oxygen absorber in there. Make sure you take that out before you blend it, otherwise, you might have a bad day. I just left mine in my shaker cup. It's food grade, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So, so. You, yeah, you can, as long as you don't eat it. As long as you don't <laughs> blend it up to me. Imagine you're walking through the post-apocalyptic wasteland 25 years from now, and you come across, you've been eating bugs, cockroaches, <laughs> you know, crows, whatever else you've been eating, and you come across this. Cheers. Cheers. All right, well, Thanks for having us out here today. It's been a blast once again. Uh, I wanna encourage you guys to go and subscribe to the Arcopia YouTube channel. Check out the Mad Max smoothies. I'll post a link in the description. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can come back in a year or so and this place is even more lush than it is right now. And uh, this is Daisy right here. She's a real cutie, a real sweetheart. I kinda wanna bring her home, but I think Marshall would be a little bit too rough for her. She's so. getting old, yep. So, yeah, come back, uh, we'll have you out anytime. It's only gonna get better, so things yeah. get bigger and I work out the kinks and finish the project, but but yeah, if you're ever thinking about building a, any project, whether it's a greenhouse or a house, give it some real good thought and it literally costs no more money. Do it properly, reduce your heating bill, so. <laughs> Is there a video on your channel that you would advise people to watch first? I did a tour, a more technical tour on the greenhouse, a main 30 minute video um, explaining all the angles and latitudes and gardening zones and, and some of the concepts I used, but. I'm gonna link that video in the description because cool. it goes into uh, a lot more technical stuff. And uh, for those of you who are maybe know a bit more about this stuff you might like that video so i'll make sure i post that go and subscribe guys check it out uh, this is i believe this is the future at least at our latitudes of building construction and it was just great to experience this today so for myself daisy dean at arcopia wish you guys the best of luck and yeah. keep prepping because things are getting weird out there guys canadian prepper out the best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive.
stay safe.